So it's been about a year now since I first picked up this milling machine. Prior to this, I really haven't had any experience with one, but with a weird hyperfixation on East German cars and a complete lack of foresight, I decided that my first project was going to be a two-stroke engine. Well, this went poorly. It didn't take long for things to start getting complicated. But out of all the different problems that I faced, the worst of it was with the cylinders. I kind of just assumed that boring on the mill was going to be similar to boring on the lathe, but it's not. I somehow ended up scoring the entire inside of the bore from top to bottom pretty badly. I was hoping if I removed enough material, I'd be able to smooth it all back out and then make up the size difference with some custom pistons. But the truth is, these were never going to work, and the only place for them is probably in the trash. So my plan for today is to make a set of new cylinders, but instead of making them entirely out of steel like I did last time, I was able to get my hands on these two big chunks of aluminum stock, which is what I'm going to use to make the main body. Now looking back, I really should have just used square extrusions instead of these round ones. These billet aluminum rounds aren't exactly the cheapest, so not only would I be saving a lot of time, but also some money too. But hey, everybody makes mistakes from time to time. So once I was done adding the two transfer ports on the bottom, I'm gonna call that good enough for now and start working on the sleeves. So the goal here is to have an interference fit by making the sleeve slightly larger than the cylinder. And to put the two of them together, I'm gonna use a technique that's known as shrink fitting. Or as I like to call it, getting one part really hot until the other one fits inside. Whoa, that was smooth. Well, at the very least, it should anyways. Ugh. That's pretty good. Yeah, everything, everything lines up correctly. So just before I finish these up, first, I gotta wait for them to cool back down. So while we're waiting, how about we talk about something ugly? Shaving. Now, if you're anything like me, your skin gets irritated just thinking about it. And a lot of times they say it's because you got sensitive skin. When in reality, that might not even be the case. Which is exactly why the sponsor of today's video, Henson Shaving, decided to make this. The Henson AL-13. Made entirely from aerospace-grade aluminum right here in Ontario, this razor is designed to deliver not just a good shave, but a much healthier shave. Now you see, these typical cartridge razors really don't have a lot of blade support, and as a result, they can cause irritation by snagging against your skin. But by holding their design to such an incredibly high standard of precision, the Henson razor does a fantastic job removing hair, all while keeping irritation at an absolute minimum. And sure, the initial cost is nothing to scoff at, but when you start to factor in just how much money you're spending on these things over and over again, getting a new razor might not be a bad idea. Especially when you use my promo code CAMDEN, because then you'll be given 100 extra blades for free with your purchase of a razor. So, go and treat yourself to a much better shave over at HensonShaving.com CAMDEN. The link will be in the description down below. Big thanks to Henson Shaving for sponsoring today's video. Now that the hardest part is out of the way, the rest of this was pretty straightforward. However, making the cylinder bore is when things started to get complicated. Okay, so it's like a little bit better, I guess. But it's still having the same problem as last time, where there's like, random low spots in the bore. I think the reason behind all this is because of just how much this thing shakes when it's running. Getting this thing anchored down to the floor would probably be a good idea. But by just making a few adjustments to my technique, the end result came out looking way better. And this time, it's actually the correct size. Now, I guess you could say that these are finished, they would bolt up and everything just fine. But I had this idea to add some cooling fins as kind of a finishing touch. Except that doing so was nearly impossible. The only ideas that I could come up with either wouldn't work for pretty obvious reasons, or would have just taken me forever to accomplish. Should have thought of that. I think my best bet would be to use a sledding saw and a rotary table to do it on the milling machine, but because I also don't happen to own either of those, I think I'm just gonna call this good enough and worry about it later.
Oh, I smell burnt. Okay. So an engine needs to have four basic things in order to work. There needs to be spark, air, fuel, and compression. Now it's just a matter of figuring out where the problem is. Right off the bat, I can tell you that the spark timing is fine. There's no issues there. But where I think the problems really start to begin is with the intake. Now you guys have been ripping on me for a while now because I haven't been using any reeds. But the whole point of this design is that it shouldn't need any in the first place. When these piston port engines are set up correctly, they can work really well. So I think the real problem is just with this thing. I haven't had like any luck with this thing, so I think I'm just gonna go back to uh, using these individual intakes. Which kind of sucks because having just a single carb would make tuning a lot easier. But once I swapped it out for a set of dual carbs, it already seems to be much happier. Although, I still don't think there's enough fuel making it to the engine, because it only seems to want to run if I quite literally dump fuel down the intake. Now if that is the case, then richening the fuel mixture should balance things out. Yeah! Just when I thought everything was all doom and gloom. Or so I thought. While adjusting the fuel mixture definitely made a big improvement, the more time that I spent trying to get this thing dialed in, things only started to get worse. Until eventually, it stopped running altogether. And with there being only one of the four options left unchecked, I think I can see why. That's actually not as bad as I thought. It's not very good though. At first, I thought I could have just gotten away with honing out all the surface chatter, but because the marks ended up being so deep, fixing it would mean having to remove a lot more material than I thought. So instead of trying to fix this one, why don't I just replace it? One of the best parts about using sleeve cylinders is that they're almost infinitely serviceable. Every time that you wear it out, you can just replace the sleeve and make it brand new again. Well, I mean at least it looks brand new. But to my surprise, it certainly didn't act like it. What is going on with this thing? In fact, I think that I might have actually made things worse. Yeah, I don't know why, but uh, this time it just doesn't have any compression. Like, absolutely nothing. And it's not like it's leaking around the head gasket or anything. You can like clearly hear that it's just leaking around the piston rings. This is really strange. But I still have one more idea. An easy way to tell if an engine isn't sealing properly is to pour a little bit of oil directly into the cylinder. If the compression drastically increases afterwards, then that means there's probably something wrong with either the piston rings or the bore. And in our case, the results are pretty obvious. But other than churning up a ton of smoke and making an even bigger mess, Ow. Oh. adding all of this oil isn't fixing the problem. Once all of it is gone, then it goes back to not running at all. So what's the problem? Why doesn't it seal properly? Obviously the diameter of the bore and the condition of the cylinder walls are important, but something that I never once considered was how round is the bore? Now ideally, a cylinder bore would be perfectly circular, but this may not always be the case. Notice how the bore gauge touches the walls in this direction, but in the other direction it fits right in? That is a big problem. It took me until just now to realize that by having these two vacant cavities on either side of the sleeve, it means there's more pressure acting on the sleeve in this direction than in this direction. So in other words, a sleeve that's supposed to look like this actually looks more like this. But what if I were to make a sleeve that only interferes with the top of the cylinder? So that way, the only pressure that's acting on the outer walls should be nice and even. But that also means the lower portion of the sleeve would need to be the exact same diameter as the inside of the cylinder. Because if it's any smaller, then that'll leave a direct avenue for gas to leak between the ports. Not good. Now realistically, there is a very small tolerance where this could still work, but trying to squeeze that level of precision out of this thing is like asking for the world. No matter how hard I try, I can always get it close, but it's never quite right. So unless I were to just magically get a new lathe, there's really not that much I can do.
Okay, so I got a new lathe. Not only does this thing have a six-speed gearhead and a working power feed, it even came with a whole bunch of other stuff as well, like all these drills, taps, reamers, and even this thing, which looks suspiciously like the barrel of a gun. But I'm not going to question it, because this new machine allows me to work with precision unlike I have ever been able to before, and it's even big enough for me to finally add those cooling fins. That being said though, making the sleeves was still pretty tough. The tolerance window for this to work is incredibly narrow, so naturally, it took me a few tries to get it right. But eventually, I had a set of sleeves which not only fit inside the cylinders, but were also perfectly round as well. But was this really going to fix anything? By this point, I have no idea. But there's only one way to find out. I gotta lower the idle on that. Oh, shit. The fire department doesn't, uh, pay us a little visit. Okay, so it may not be perfect. But now that it is running, I really want to see how it behaves completely on its own. Preferably somewhere outside of my garage. So I rigged it up outside. And with just a little bit of help... It fired right up. sound good. Has compression still. At first I thought that I might have broken it, but watching the slow-mo back, you can actually see one of the flywheel nuts had loosened itself and flew off, causing one of the bolts to jam up against the crankcase. But once it was put back on, we were back in business. After a few minutes, however, it started to have some trouble running. I thought that it might have started to overheat. I mean, running it this fast for this long is generally something you want to avoid. But to my surprise, it didn't actually get that hot. I don't think it overheated or anything because it is hot, but it's like not any hotter than what a normal engine would get up to. This is probably its operating temperature to be honest. Whatever the reason might be, I wish I could say that was the only problem. Yeah, that's not exactly ideal. The truth is, this thing has been a basket case ever since the beginning. Lots of little mistakes and oversights that contributed to one of the most frustrating things I have ever worked on. But I definitely learned a lot of new skills, all of which I'm going to put towards the next iteration. So, if you want to see me make more things like this, then subscribe, and I will do that.